so I'm going to actually start the demonstration. It's going to go throughout the duration of the talk. Um, we're going to test the oil beforehand, and we're going to test both samples. So I have two hot plates. This is on a higher setting that's a little bit above 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The cooler plate is around 270 degrees. So I did the experiment earlier. Um, we got really nice reaction here and slight reaction here. Um, so I'm going to start them up. I have about a half gram each. And Yash is actually going to, we're going to live stream this onto this monitor right here so we can actually see what's going on. You have to make sure that you've applied heat at some point for the right amount of time and at the right temperature and in the right conditions to achieve decarboxylation. We're going to dive right into some chemistry on what, what is it? What is decarboxylation? The, the plant, the cannabis plant itself, produces mainly the acid form of THC. THC is that molecule that is uh, that gets you high. Okay, it's that it's that molecule that's mostly responsible for what you feel. However, the plant doesn't produce that much THC. What it does produce is THC acid, THCA. That molecule right there, those sticks and stuff. That what that is is a, is a is the way the atoms are connected in that molecule, and that's what interacts with the molecules in your body in your brain to get you high, right? Except this one is a little bit different from that one. The difference is that COOH group, it's called a functional group, there's an extra bit of atoms, there are ex an extra four atoms, um, actually three atoms, two atoms here that are, three atoms here that are not here, right? You guys see those? One, two, three, four, and then three atoms, the COO comes out and we only have an H left over. So this part of the molecule comes off. That's called decarboxylation. This is carboxylic acid. When that comes off, it's called decarboxylation. That's why, it, that's why it's called that. It's because of that, that group. Um, it comes off as, anybody know what it comes off as? What, what it looks like when it comes out, when it comes off? Champagne bottles. Champagne bottles, bottles, yes. Anything else? Like, what, what is that? What is it, though? You've heard of that. The carbon dioxide. Right. Carbon dioxide, yeah, it's what we breathe out, right? That's at least in part what we're seeing here. It's CO2, okay? CO2 is a gas, it's what we exhale, it's really commonly found in the atmosphere, and more and more and more these days is with, with global warming and all that. But, but that's what comes off of the molecule in decarboxylation. Um, it, the reason people have been smoking <coughs> cannabis for thousands of years instead of just eating it raw is because that's what works. And that's what works because when you're smoking, you're applying heat. Uh, initially, that was really the only way to get the cannabis into your lungs, so people thought that that's why it worked. But no, you also it also has the added benefit of, of decarboxylation, which is required to feel the psychoactive effects. So th this is uh, what we do and how we can figure out whether a product has been decarboxylated or not. We what we do, we take a sample in, whether it's bud or, or an oil, right, De or a decarbed oil, like uh, Rick Simpson oil or an edible or virtually anything. And we, what we do is we aggressively extract all the cannabinoids from that sample, and then we process that, and we process it, and we dilute it, and then we inject it on our HPLC, which is high performance liquid chromatography. And what that does is it separates all of the cannabinoids from each other. That's what, yeah, this is actually, this was injected like yesterday. And this is a, uh, this is a, a vial that contains 10 different cannabinoids. In it. There's, um, that guy right there is CBN. This is THC. This is THCA. All right, that's CBC. There's CBDA. There's CBD. There's CBGA. We, we, we do a bunch of different cannabinoids, okay? And the point here is that you can see individual molecules and how much, the size of the peak indicates how much of that molecule there is, all right? So if somebody brought us a, a, a flower, this right here is a, not very typical, but it's a flower, right? What we see here is, well, this, this molecule is there, right? What is that? THCA. We see this molecule, which is CBDA. This is about a one-to-one -one so, you know, close to one to one CBD to THC flower. This is, um, this is where THC comes out. 
there's very little THC compared to the THCA and the CBDA in the flower because the flower doesn't produce THC, it produces THCA. Okay? This is another sample, a different sample. This is a decarboxylated <coughs> edible. Okay, this is an edible from which we extracted all the cannabinoids. And what you see here is that there's very little THCA and a whole bunch of THC. And this one is actually CBN. There's a little bit of CBN creeping in. Okay, so what's what's going on? Why why are we? Does that make sense? Do you guys have you guys heard of that? Why is there CBN? What is? It? First one got cooked too well. But yeah, so yeah. Right. It's an oxidant. It oxidizes. The the, the THC right. gets oxidized and converted into CBN. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So, so we do have, you know, we very often we focus on this one reaction of THCA. You apply heat, you get THC. However, anytime you put a molecule, a pretty complicated molecule, into heat, into the presence of heat, it's going to maybe react and and produce something else. Okay. So THC with heat gives you CBN as well. And not just CBN, it actually gives you a whole bunch of other stuff. It does start breaking apart under heat. So when you are decarboxylating from THCA into THC, you want to be very careful because if you apply a lot of heat, you are destroying your THC molecule and you're making other things, such as CBN. Do you know what temperature that happens at? Mm, it'll happen at least a little bit at every temperature, but the point is to, the time, to control time it. Um, every reaction is... You know, a chemical reaction when a molecule becomes a different molecule, or two molecules become a third molecule, or one molecule falls apart into two molecules, all of that happens, it's all real, you know, it's always like a real thing falling apart in this case. We have a THCA molecule and it falls apart. And how fast that happens, you know, we can do some experiments, and people have done a lot of experiments to figure out what, you know, what makes it go faster, what makes it go slower, what, um, you know, how, how does this reaction behave, you know? Uh, so, so I want to talk a little bit about reaction rates just to, for us to understand. A zero order reaction means that the re it doesn't matter how much of that molecule there is, the reaction happens at a certain rate. So if you take a gram of THCA, just pure THCA, and you leave it at, at, at a temperature, if it was a zero order reaction, then um, every, say, hour, you have a certain number of THCA molecules converting into THC molecules. Um, a first order reaction is a little bit different in that the, the rate depends on how much of the material you have, how much of that molecule you have. If you had a gram of THCA, the reaction would be faster than if you had a half of a gram of THCA per volume, it's, it's, per con it's concentration, not gram, but gram per mil or something, okay? So a first order reaction, the more of that molecule you have, the faster the reaction. Therefore, after a little while, a little while the reaction is gonna slow down because you're running out of your molecule. Whereas in a zero order reaction, that rate is the same whether you are at the beginning of your reaction or at the end, okay? And the second order reaction is even more uh, dependent on the amount of that initial reactant than in the first order. It, that's just a very, very simplified way of doing it, of, of talking about it. We're not going to do calculus today, but it is. it does invo involve a little bit of calculus. turns out that decarboxylation is, in their case, it was a, a, in the solid phase. What they did was they took bud, they crushed it up, they, I don't know, they, uh, put it under vacuum and they heated it at different temperatures, they looked at um, how quickly the THCA disappeared. So they took it out every five minutes and they saw what was left over. Um, and what they saw was that it's a pseudo first order reaction. It's something that I think you guys have all kind of seen um, in that the amount of THCA, you have to really work for that last little bit um, of, of decarboxylation. You know, you can get 50% of it pretty easily, you can get 75% of it, not as easy, but you can do it. To get up into the 90s is difficult, okay? You're, you're now treading some really fine lines to get 
to get up there, you have to make sure you're not losing THC. There's, there's just a lot more involved. But getting that last little bit of THCA to convert isn't as, as easy as the first little bit of THCA. Okay? So it does seem to depend on how much THCA there is to begin with. You know, they're confirming that at, at, at higher temperatures, you get faster decarboxylation than lower temperatures. And this is linear with respect to the natural log, which is a fancy way of saying first order. You can model this, take a natural log, which is a mathematical function of, of this, you get a straight line. And that's what they're seeing, is that you get straight lines of the natural log. It's first order. Here's a short of it. All right. Um, there's also this really famous little graph that many of you may have seen. It's available online. It, it, it shows you um, the effect of heating time and temperature on the, the amount of, of THC present. And the reason I bring this up is that generally there is a maximum, and then the THC begins to go away again. And that, that little spot at the top, that, that pinnacle, that um, is very hard to achieve. A lot of people either are below it or way above it, and they have full decarboxylation, but they're really like over here, and they've lost a whole bunch of THC. Um, happens all the time. And it's okay, you still, you know, you do have, you have converted all of your THCA, and our instruments will show that there's no THCA left, but you don't know whether you're at, at, at your peak. So in a perfect decarboxylation, you've lost 12.3% of your weight. So if you start with a gram of THCA and you decarb it perfectly, you're going to wind up with 877 milligrams of THC. Same thing with CBDA to CBD. That's if under perfect conditions and if you know how to weigh properly. Or oh. Hi everyone, so my name is Chanel Lindsay. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you guys a little bit about decarboxylation. Um, so decarboxylation has been near and dear to my heart for about 15 years now, a major part of my life. And um, so I'm from Boston, I'm an attorney, um, but also I am a mom, I'm a business owner, but I've also been using cannabis as a medicine for going on 15 years now. And so uh, after my son was born, I got an ovarian cyst and I had already used cannabis for recreation and loved it. And uh, my doctors were trying to put me on really high levels of acetaminophen and I was worried about my liver and thought, you know, I hear people out in California and Colorado, they're doing good things with medical cannabis, let me try to make this medicine. And so um, I was back then just doing what everyone else was, kind of what I consider like back in the dark ages a little bit, which is just plugging away in your kitchen and figuring out, looking online and doing your own methods and finding out like really what works for you and what what seemed like it worked. Um, so that's making, you know, butters and oils and um, and other topicals and and I was happy with being able to use cannabis as a medicine. It was very helpful for me, but I was not happy with the processes that I was doing. It was taking a long time. It was smelling. Um, I really wasn't happy with incorporating a lot of butter and oil into my diet at that point. I was in my late 20s then and um, and wanted to be healthy and that kind of thing. And so um, it was really a blessing that, you know, medical cannabis came to Massachusetts and then getting access to a place like MCR where you have a lab. And so now we are in the space where there's opportunity to do testing and, you know, I think a lot of people in this room are, are into that kind of thing, is understanding what your medicine is all, all about. I think that we all know cannabis is a very powerful medicine, so um, you can it's so amazing you can almost kind of like slap it together and it'll still do a good job but I think that now when as it medicines advancing and as people are trying to get more into the science of it there's another deeper level that you can go and try to figure out you know exactly what's going on and for, so people can we can take it from hey this kind of holistic thing into uh, a real respected piece of, of science and medicine and um, and that's what's required of it to, to get it there so um, so for me personally, um, when I encountered the lab, it was an opportunity to really get some hard data and some answers to the avenues that I was pursuing in order to try to um, you know, bring cannabis medicine or, or figure out um, how to best access it. And so at that time, um, 
uh, so I wanted to today share kind of some of those things that I've learned and discovered along the way with the data and science and then hopefully, you know, answer some of the questions and I'm sure open up a whole new can of worm of questions with some of the things that, that we've encountered along the way. So just to start, I wanted to um, kind of talk about how we, how I, I've been approaching cannabis and decarboxylation. Uh, it really has been from the side of the cannabis flower and decarboxylating the flower um, and the materials that come from the flower. Um, we saw some extractions being decarbed and, you know, my work has taken me into extractions as well mm -hmm. because, you know, people are using them and they want to use them, um, you know, with the Nova. But when it comes to, you know, the way that we've approached it in the kitchen, it's been to actually activate the plant. And then, in my opinion, you have a lot of different ways to use it afterwards. You can smoke it and get an enhanced smoke out of it. It's really simple to kind of make easy topicals and edibles and infusions mm -hmm. and other things like that. Um, and so when I began, you know, doing and working on this, it was really with the crock pot. And that's a really popular way that people use to decarboxylate. Um, the heat and the temperature is, um, one, the situation is where you really can't hurt, it's harder to hurt the cannabis than, right, than using an oven or something with a, a more variable temperature because the, the crock pot and the liquid in the crock pot is going to boil at a more even, even rate. Um, and so, um, going back to using, um, but in flour, an another point there uh, is you we're starting to encounter a lot of um, cannabis medicine that doesn't um, have solvents in it, like rosin, um, using keef, and some other um, materials. So I do think it's important um, to understand how decarboxylating, the nuances of decarbing bud uh, versus oil and other things like that. So back to um, the crock pot. So uh, when I came in and first started testing crock pot here at MCR, uh, I was very surprised because what I had been doing um, was using the crock pot for about an hour and a half, you know, making butters and oils or another really popular way is taking, um, you know, a bud and sticking it inside a bag and then sticking it in the um, crock pot and, and letting that boil. Um, and what we found was um, that it's very, very difficult to get full decarb. Um, using the crock pot. It takes a long time and this is really a practical uh, demonstration of what we saw in the scientific pseudo first order which is it, it's really really hard to crank out that last bit of THC. And so this is, um, these illustrations and the pictures you see is actually from a decarb guide that we put together which is kind of a synthesis of all some of the testing that we've done here. And that's available online for anybody who wants to look at it so I will um, let you see that, but I also have some of the raw data behind this that I thought would be cool to share with you guys here um, since we're doing kind of a deeper into the science decarb. So I'll just show, talk to you a little bit about it first. Um, you can see, um, actually we'll just go to the raw data. So you can see that, um, you know, if you're increasing time, you are um, not really m much more increasing the THC that you have there. And, and even when you're moving from 75 to 90 to 105 minutes, you're still having significant amounts of THCA there. And then you're looking at almost two hours <coughs> all over heat and, and starting to see a, a degradation in the amount of total THC that you're getting there at the end. And, you know, sometimes when you see variations, it can be from the actual variation in the flower. When you start to see it multiple times, you can think it's, it's from degradation. Um, and so that avenue seemed like a dead end in some respects for getting good, um, good decarboxylation. Um, number one, because of the time constraint. You, you, when you're talking to people about decarbing and making medicine, they want that medicine done pretty quickly. And so when you're talking about a couple of hours and um, that seems to be an issue there. Um, but also people want full decarb. And so then I think the next thing was to start looking at the oven and the toaster oven and doing testing on that. So when you're talking about decarb, you're talking about the time and the temperature, and you're also talking about atmosphere. You know, you're seeing a lot of <clears throat> oxidation from CBN happening from, um, from oxygen being present while decarbing is happening, not just from excessive heat there. Um, and so when you're looking at, if we're going back to the crock pot here, we're talking about temperature. You know, the temperature that water boils at is 100 degrees Celsius, so 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you're getting, again, good decarb after six, after 60 minutes, you're getting, um, you're, you're still having 36% 36 decarb um, THC left. 
and you're not getting much better at 90 minutes you're starting to crank out a little bit more but at, over here we saw you know 20 percent loss here and so um this temperature you're thinking okay 212 why don't we just try to crank it up a little bit um and see what we can do um in an oven and we also saw higher temperatures when michael was talking um uh, 110 degrees um uh celsius so right around the 240. so we started doing experiments on a, a oven and toaster oven uh, to see what those would yield and you can get that higher temperature but you're starting to run into um, the fluctuation in temperature and not being able to control the temperature with the oven so on one hand you have uh, the water um, it's good but the water is never going to boil to a high enough temperature to get you where you want to be and then on the other side you're having an oven where you're having the fluctuations in the temperature and the other thing to note about an oven or a toaster oven is that um, you have the kind of the position of the heating elements being a challenge um, and getting even heat because if you're having heating elements everybody knows a toaster oven and oven the heating elements are kind of up here and then you have this middle space and so even if you have know what your oven says it is there's going to be fluctuations 10 or 20 degrees in between um, so it becomes very difficult i mean people on the dispensary level when they're decarbing keith and that kind of thing they're using um, <clears throat> ovens with multiple temperature sensors and people are monitoring those so it becomes really kind of labor intensive there so person at home um, we were finding that kind of doing it at home was was difficult on the oven side and you can see though how sensitive the process is we're only talking about the difference between 212 and 240 degrees Fahrenheit after doing those testing uh, what we did with these guys here was just more bat more battery of testing of, um, of different temperatures really honing in on that temperature right somewhere between that 110 and the, the 100 degrees um, uh, Celsius and ended up um, finding what that right temperature which is not over 103 degrees Celsius and developing a device that, um, that, that does that. And, um, and this is a sample of one of the tests that brought the raw data from another test that we just did. Um, so you're getting full decarb there and you're not getting um, degradation to CBN um, and it's easy for patients to do. So um, one of the things that we saw that was really important was getting that even heating as well, which is um, why we kind of moved away from doing something that was a heating element like an oven and really have a, um, a round, a, a heater surrounding the entire, so it's like a silicone heater inside here surrounding the entire cavity, so you're getting that even heating and then using multiple sensors. Um, to control that heating blanket and then using an algorithm that makes sure that the sensors are getting to the right temperature every single time and monitoring that and and rolling through along the way you know we ran into people starting to use the um, decarb oxalator for extracts and so here's just an example of um, bho being decarb what we noticed with the extracts is that um, we're noticing a more concentrated product at the end likely from boil off of residual solvents um, or Again, this is BHO in this instance. So, um, in my personal opinion, what I've seen, it seems like there is um, a little more give when you're decarbing with extracts um, when something is already in that oil. I just think that Mike made a great point, though, about using high temperatures with oil and really mm -hmm. there needing to be more data on what loss is happening there because um, one thing we see in decarb is is that you know you, you're quickly getting loss there. So I'd like to. You know, I think the future of decarb is really exploring kind of the fixative property of the oils and then also really doing comparative tests to see, you know, hey, the THC will be there. And we see that a lot, like there'll be a degradation of THC and no CBN. So you, you might think at first glance that you haven't degraded, but there's half the THC that was there before. So it's going somewhere. It's just not being picked up as something that, um, you know, it's coming up on the, on the test to get to that full decarboxylation of THC without any degradation to CBD and we've, um, to the CBN and we've done that. And I think it's a combination of the lack of oxygen coming in here. So no oxygen and then a really, really, really tight temperature control, you know, where you're getting to that 100. And again, that's what, you know, the, the algorithm varies, but it does not go above that internal temperature of 103 C. So 218 Fahrenheit. And, um, and then there's an outer control on the outer sensor as well. So it's a, you know, it's a cycle that it goes through and it's like a proprietary 
algorithms work really hard to even get that, but that's the, that's the time and the temperature parameter that you need to, to be at and below. And it's very, very difficult to get there, you know, when you're just using kind of the imprecise methods um, of the oven and the toaster oven or, you know, or the crock pot. Um, Do you find that it works because of the volume of that you have the size you can't go larger how much material yeah so the we get it um so you can fit as much material in here as you can fit in here uh, and you can also decarb just a teeny bit too so if the, but it doesn't matter if it's touched it's packed no nope, it doesn't matter you can fill it up we don't we say don't like jam it in there but you can fill it we do get a uh you know often ask for a commercial size a bigger size you know and that's the next thing we we'll probably will come out with a commercial size but part of this and part of my personal mission is to give education and power to people and patients you know what i mean on the patient level and so for them to have a device that is that they understand that it's small and that you can and people can start understanding you need so little to actually get your medicine like that's the thing people are using so much now because their methods of decarboxylation are so poor that they're having to use like I hear people using like, you know, seven grams to make a batch of cookies. That's like ridiculous. You know, when you're talking about, if you're looking at this sample here, you know, you're talking about 19% THC in the bud that's coming out of that. That's 190 milligrams in every gram. Like think about how many cookies or things that you can, how many 20 milligram doses you can make with that in one gram, 20, you know? So you, people, they can, they can realize that, that, um, there's a lot of utility here, and so I think that's part of it, and especially important for people that are, you know, don't have a lot of money and don't have experience with cannabis. So, so that size of how long then does the process take? So it's an hour and oh, that's enough. Thank you for pointing that. So um, it's an hour, um, an hour and fifteen minutes for total for heat up and cool down time, and that's the thing I think you know you have to balance when you're thinking about decarboxylation. You want it fast, but the temperature is, you want to keep it as low a temperature as possible. There's a reason why people want to try to do it in like sous vide or in the crock pot because the temperature is low enough that you're keeping terpenes intact and the bud isn't burnt up, you know what I mean? And so that was always our desire to keep that temperature as low as possible, you know, but the, the boil, the water boil method is just not high enough. So pumping it up just a little bit, but then keeping it low enough, um, you know, you're getting the timing of, um, you know, like I said, the hour, it's, it's really an hour for the cycle, but the heat up and cool down time gets you to an hour and a half. And proper drying and curing really doesn't do significant decarb at all. So here's some examples of dried and cured. So some of them you have zero, some of them you have one. I even went through um, and did a little bit more searching on MCR site, I didn't see anything that really was above 1.1. Some of them I saw that was higher and I, I consider that not very good curing process. You know, excessive heat exposure, you know, being in a hot car, being in a hot room, you know, um, things that you don't want to be um, holding your cannabis to. So, um, that was just a... How long would it cure with this? Yeah, so some of these were around for a couple of months, some of them were more fresh, but it doesn't, um, okay. this is a, just a mixed bag okay. of, um, from caregivers and growers that I respect and do a good job. Right, okay, yeah, it's like a month to a year old yeah. probably. I wouldn't, yeah, yeah, probably around six months. Uh, one concentrates in it? Yeah, so this was the BHO concentrate that we did. So here's a starting, um, before the decarb, and again, this is an example that BHOs properly, um, properly purged and and um, aren't decarboxylated. So you have seventy one percent THC, all eighty eighty percent, um, almost all of it. So I think this one was like that calculation is like three percent decarbed or five percent of total. So one percent of is that right? One percent of the eighty. So. Then we're seeing uh, the conversion here. Obviously, when, as Michael mentioned before, when you decarb, when that THC loses that molecule and the THCA loses that molecule, there's a, um, there's a conversion, there's a loss there. So loss of 13%. Yeah. So what we would see, ex expect to see here is a maximum of 71, even though you see THCA is 80%. The maximum, theoretically, there possibly could be a 71% once it's converted. So you multiply the THCA by 0.877 and you add that to the THC. And we saw that this one, when it came out, it was a little bit more concentrated again, I think from boil off of residual so solvents. Uh, obviously, there's a time uh, difference. No. As far as work. So you could fill that thing up to the top with concentrate. Yes, and I wouldn't fill it to the top because it would well, bubble, but right. yes, you could, but you fill, could it. fill it to whatever. Yes, and you can. 
versus this much or this yes. much. And it'll be the same amount yes. of time uh, to decarb the whole amount. Yes. Of and this was at lower, you know, and this is at significantly lower temperatures than we were doing over here. It was a, a little bit longer, you know, um, time frame, obviously. But again, um, we're not seeing loss, and I don't know what the comparison for loss is for this. And again, this is the concentrate isn't our like main focus, even though lots of people have been using it for concentrates. And you know, we're actually coming out with the silicone sleeves to put in here, so people can because we said you have to put the concentrate on a sleeve. You don't want it to be scraping it off the bottom sure. of here. Um, so let's see, we're talking about um, CBD. Okay, so CBD. Um, Yes, it does take more energy than THC, but what, it might, what we found is in, that it's more volatile than THC as well, um, and it requires tighter control, and so here's just a little sampling of testing that we did at the 105 and 110, and I have to say I completely disagree with the um, Swedish paper that said that 110 for um, 110 for 110 C for 110 minutes, got them the full decarb. Like I said, we get the full decarb at 103C for 60 minutes as part of our, so we never go higher. We never go higher than that 103 and then we're getting there. So I think, you know, you're preserving more terpenes at that point and you're not, you know, burning off the product. So here's just an example of um, CBD. So this is a high CBD strain. Here you see we barely have any THC at all, but you know, um, and nine, almost 20% CBD. So this is like, uh, I think auto too, but it was a, uh, um, um, uh, this was a, a push and you can see here, you know, we're starting out with a maximum 17 and we're we're already down to the 11 percent So we're, lo we're you know, there's loss here even at the 105 at 60 minutes. And so this is um, uh, From the testing and the work that we've done The CBD is more sensitive, but it's also I think going to be dependent on whether you're having a mix of THC in there as well what I've seen is that the ones that are very, very, very high CBD are a little bit more, um, are more fickle here. So, and then you see we still don't have full decarb at that point. We're pretty, you know, we're getting there, but not full. Um, I'm wondering too if um, with CBD it's going to be necessary to mix with an oil with the high CBD strains and then decarb, um, you know, for the fixative properties of the oil, that's something we're going to be looking into. One thing I happened to come across recently was, and I ran into it before, but I saw that it recently got granted, and it was it's a patent for um, accelerating or limiting decarboxylation reaction in an extract. And I don't think, I don't know if it has any validity or not, but I just thought it was an interesting kind of like, you know, something that's out there that I wanted to get you know, everyone's opinion on. So what they essentially say is that they make an extract. In, in many, many respects, it looks just like any other making an extract and decarbing. Um, and so they start by putting it in an oven and then they put it in an alcohol extract and start evaporating it off. But the interesting thing is they talk about um, using a cofactor, V6 vitamin, to um, modulate the decarboxylation reaction. Uh, they don't give any scientific proof or tests or anything surrounding it, um, but what they do, the part that I thought was interesting is they said that if you add a specific amount of this B6 that it will essentially halt the reaction at a certain point and stop any further decarboxylation. Um, so I could see that if people were interested, I do think that the future of cannabis is after people really understand decarboxylation um, and CBN and how things work um, differently because, you know, even we have a lot of people who are searching for CBN in some instances, like people, vets with PTSD and wanting to create certain things. So I think after we understand kind of the basics of getting to the best practices for getting, you know, full medicine conversion and that kind of thing, people are going to start using really tailored um, cannabinoids in medicine. So when the bud comes out, like you make different things, like here's like a toner for your face, and we also have made these sublingual wraps so that you put the bud in it and stick it under your tongue, because I think that sublingual use is a really underutilized. I think it's a great way for absorption a lot better than digestion for most people. And, um, and so we made those wraps, and we also have these capsules. So the decarb guide is at um, www.tinyurl.com slash decarb guide. 
a G-carb guide that we came up with uh, about myths of D-carb and it's based on the research that we've done here. So it just kind of has an introduction and goes into like what is decarboxylation and um, you know kind of discusses some of the things but here's that graph we were talking about and I say like you know beware of that because it's just you know just beware of the conditions that you're looking at when people are decarbing. Just like you know be careful if you see like Hey, here's an aw he hey, here's an awesome decarb product, and there's like five milligrams of THC, and you're like, oh, that looks amazing. But what if there could have been 25 milligrams of THC in there? You know what I mean? It doesn't seem so great at that point. So always ask for like before testing, after, you know, compared to the after testing. That's really important. Um, and the BHO extract, and people think you need to grind before you decarb, and that's kind of a method that people use to. Um, try to make oven decarb more accurate by increasing like the surface area like you don't have to grind if you're doing like a really precise uh, decarb with the nova and grinding it you know you're disturbing the trichrome so if you're you're going to be able to increase shelf life if you're not um, doing that and then fats and alcohols and using those to prepare canvas so, um, so tiny url dot com tiny slash decarb guide